The Mansion in the Mist by John Belairs, Chapter 6. The night dragged on, and still Emerson and Anthony did not return. Miss Eels threw her knitting into a corner and paced up and down the living room floor, chewing her lip anxiously. Every now and then she would go to the front door of the cottage, open it, and peer out into the night. The wind was rising, and it made an eerie sound among the thick clustered pines. After staring into the pitch blackness for a while, Miss Eels would close the door and go on pacing while the shelf clock ticked endlessly. Miss Eels was a good imaginer, and she was dreaming up all sorts of horrible things that might have happened. Finally, at a little after two in the morning, the chest lid slammed thunderously overhead. Oh, thank God, breathed Miss, e breathed Miss Eels as she clasped her hands prayerfully. Presently, she heard footsteps on the squeaky steps, and she rushed to the bottom of the staircase. Out of the shadows, Emerson and Anthony appeared. They both looked pale and haggard, and sweat was streaming from their faces. Woodenly, they clumped on down, and Miss Eels stepped out of the way to let them pass. She followed them into the living room and watched as they sagged into armchairs. So far, neither one of them had said a word. Miss Eels perched on a rocking chair and waited. Finally, Emerson spoke. He sounded incredibly weary, and his voice shook. I would never have believed that it was possible, he said as he took off his glasses and cleaned them with his handkerchief. I really never would have, but it's true. That strange otherworldly world otherworldly world is really out there and i'll tell you something else the world is in danger our world i mean i don't want to sound over dramatic but we've got to do something and we've got to do it soon miss yells looked utterly bewildered m what on earth do you mean she asked you're talking about total no you're talking absolute total nonsense emerson stared hard at his sister and a weary frown curled his lips am i am i really with a heavy sigh he picked up his meerschaum pipe which lay in the glass ashtray on a nearby table. He unzipped a leather pouch and lifted the pipe. Then he struck a match. Clouds of smoke spewed out into the room. Tell her, Anthony, Emerson sighed. Tell her the whole ghastly, unlikely story. Anthony's mouth dropped open. He had never thought that he was terribly good with words, and here was Emerson asking him to tell the tale. Anthony took a deep breath, and, out of a lot, and after a lot of hemming and hawing, he began. They had wound up spying on another meeting of the Autarchs, and they really got an earful. The Autarchs and their servants were turning the mansion and the grounds upside down looking for the mysterious Logos cube. As Anthony had heard before, they needed to keep it. They needed to keep their other dimensional world in place. But they had another purpose, a far more sinister one in mind. They wanted to use the cube to drag the Earth and its inhabitants off into their dimension. Anthony stopped talking, and for a long time, no one said anything. The clock clattered on, and the wind rattled through the windows of the old cottage. Finally, Miss Eel spoke. It seems a bit hard to believe, she said in a weak, throaty voice. I mean, yes, it is hard to believe, snapped Emerson, cutting in suddenly. But then appearing and disappearing chests are hard to believe, too. Mansions and other dimensions are hard to believe. But those things are there, Anthony, and I have seen them. Maybe it's impossible for the Autarchs to find the Logos Cube. Maybe it's impossible for them to carry out their nasty, unthinkable scheme. But what if they could do it? Would you enjoy living in a world lit by misty moonlight, a world where plants scream and vines try to grab you? No, I didn't think you would, and I'll tell you something else, in case you think the Autarchs would be kindly to dictators. I found out what happened to the three people I rented this cottage to a few years ago. You Miss Eel's jaw dropped. You have? Yes, as Anthony and I were leaving the mansion, I happened to glance toward the evil garden. It has three statues in it, three very strange statues of people writhing in hideous torment. The light was weak, but it was good enough for me to see the face of one of the figures, and... Emerson paused and swallowed hard. And... He went on in a strange voice. In a strange voice. And the face looked very much like the face of one of the three tourists who rented this cottage from me. Lucille stared in amazement. You mean... She began hesitantly. You mean? Yes, I do indeed mean, said Emerson. Somehow those three poor people discovered the secret of the chest. They probably used the card that Anthony found in the dusty old vase, and they paid for their curiosity with their lives. It's awful to think about, isn't it? And that is the faith that lies in store for people in our world if they come under the dominion of the Autarchs. I don't think they can do it muttered Anthony stubbornly. They're not powerful enough to do that, are they? Well, are they? 
Emerson heaved a weary sigh. I don't know, he said slowly. I honestly don't know. But as long as there is even a small chance that such an evil thing might happen, I think I had better go back there and find that dreaded cube. Miss Eels was aghast. Em, have you complete are you completely have you gone completely out of your mind? You haven't a clue that would lead you to the cube. Emerson stared at the burning tobacco in the bowl of his pipe. Oh, I don't know about that, he said. There is that card Anthony found. Where is it, by the way? Anthony got up and walked across the room to a round mahogany end table. He yanked open a drawer and pulled out a wrinkled piece of cardboard. Without a word, he handed it to Emerson, who adjusted his glasses and squinted at the neat square right at the neat square printing. Auto est locus in quo conflator, he murmured. Gold gathered together somewhere, a nugget, a gold statuette, a necklace. And how would such a thing help us find the Logos cube? I can't imagine how. Then there's this thing with the great clue being in the Temple of the Winds. But I didn't see anything that looked like a miniature temple when we were at the mansion. Of course, there may be more to the ghost estate than what we've seen. There's that mess of trees. And who knows what may lie beyond it. At any rate, I intend to go back and explore. I will not listen to anyone who tells me not to go. Emerson folded his arms and looked as stubborn as he possibly could. Miss Eels was, in, was near despair. Well, if you want to kill yourself, I suppose it's your business, she said bitterly. Oh, I don't know, said Emerson, who was turning back to his usual optimistic self. I got the two of us back safe and sound, didn't I? Miss Seals said nothing for several minutes. Then she pulled herself to her feet and yawned. I don't know about you two, but I'm going to bed, and if I were you, Emerson Eels, I'd think long and hard before I went back to that dark and dangerous place. You may think you're saving the world, but you'll end up breaking your neck. Emerson sniffed disdainfully, then he got up and walked off to the foot of the stairs to get a candle to light his way to bed. The other two followed him, and that is the end of chapter 6.